When your academic mission has big ambitions, you need a plan and the capabilities to make it happen. As global leaders in higher education consulting, we can help you reimagine the future and deliver it. With more than 20 years of experience, we are the consulting partner of choice for more than 200 leading universities in Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Like the university leaders we partner with, we are passionate about the transformative power of education and are proud to have helped them achieve their mission and improve the lives of their teams, students, and communities. NASA's higher education team works collaboratively across jurisdictions, including with our specialist benchmarking team at Cubain to share expertise and connections that benefit our clients. Our work spans all functions of a university, as well as education policy and third-party providers. Following the disruption of the pandemic, Universities today have the opportunity to reset and build stronger, vibrant and more aspirational institutions. We look forward to continuing our partnership with you and realising that ambition together. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Hoy. Uh, I have been a Vice-Chancellor since 2007 and I currently have the pleasure of uh, being Vice-Chancellor of the University of Adelaide. Uh, long time ago, I was the CEO of uh, the Australian Research Council, uh, but I was followed by the person I'm going to introduce now, Margaret Scheel, and it all uh, went well from there. Uh, Margaret is well known to all of you. Margaret, of course, is, is an AO, but Margaret uh, currently is the Vice-Chancellor of QUT, Prior to that, Margaret was uh, provost at University of Melbourne, uh, I think from 2011 to 17. And before that, she had uh, a five-year reign as the CEO of the Australian Research Council. And before that, Margaret was uh, DVCR at University of Wollongong. And before that, uh, uh, a great chemist whom I actually first met in 1992 when we were both interested in mass spectrometry. There's much more to say about Margaret. Uh, you can probably read it in a bio, but I think we should give Margaret lots of time to tell us about the interesting reviews she's been leading uh, on the ARC. So welcome, Margaret. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, we often reflect on our unusually overlapping careers and interests, so uh, it's wonderful to be here with Peter on, on stage to talk about this important uh, review. I begin also by acknowledging the, la the traditional owners of the land we meet on here in Canberra and also the uh, Turrbal and the Yagra people where QUT stands. So I'm going to very quickly run through where we're up to and uh, then hopefully leave some time uh, for some questions. And uh, if you want more details of the actual terms of reference or the consultation paper, you can find them on the Education Department website. So I'm going to talk briefly about the aims of the review, some of the themes that have uh, been given back to us through feedback and consultation, the importance of the role of the ARC and trust in the ARC, some reflections on government governance, the purpose, uh, research evaluation and excellence in research for Australia, uh, what might come next, some brief process recommendations and the relationship to some other activities, if, for example, the Accord, and also the important work that the ARC is do itself doing in a range of areas. So the aim of the review was to consider the role and purpose of the ARC within the system uh, so that it can maintain the trust of the research sector, and I'll come back to that, and particularly focusing on any legislative uh, uh, impediments or, or improvements that could be made to the legislation to assist the ARC with their work and to uh, clarify its role and then looking at, at the scope of the, the legislation. And so again, there's, this is being underpinned by a lot of work being done by the ARC itself on, on, on some other areas of their activities. So this idea about trust, I'll come back to because that's very, that's critical. So we've had a range of direct conversations with university groups, peak bodies, 
uh, with researchers themselves, with members of the College of Experts. We've received submissions to a consultation paper that was targeted to some areas we were particularly interested in, uh, both from individuals and um, peak bodies, and we've, myself and my members of my panel have enjoyed reading those over the Christmas period. We've had a whole range of feedback, um, both within and outside those consultations, with both uh, which have reinforced the importance and support for the ARC, but also with ideas always for improvement. So the themes of that feedback, again, importance of ARC, and particularly as it's in its role of seeding and supporting fundamental and discovery research, which underpins our entire research e ecosystem. Uh, the need to have robust and transparent pro processes, potentially the need for more flexibility, the importance of academic expertise, both within the ARC itself and, and using that expertise to inform their decisions. The important role that the ARC plays across the full spectrum of research, apart from medical and dental, and also uh, at different levels and how that interacts with fellowships. Uh, the important need to support and map Indigenous research uh, and support Indigenous researchers. And that, again, that idea of, of trust uh, and that relates to research integrity, ethics, equity, and the way in which the ARC can shape the research ecosystem. We heard yesterday a little bit about the uh, international engagement from the, the National Science F Foundation and the need to st for the ARC and our research sector to stay engaged internationally has been a, a theme. Importance of uh, um, maintaining the ARC free of political interference and uh, uh, we, a, a general level of understanding of the importance of national security issues. So that trust underpins both uh, is the trust in the peer review process and the expertise that's making decisions that have impacts on people's future and the direction of research in Australia, trust in the decision makers and integrity and transparency. And at various times in in, in the ARC's history over the last 20 or so years, that trust has been broken, and it's largely been broken because of political interference. And so the ministerial interference in 2006 by Nelson and subsequent uh, ministers uh, in 2017, 2018 and 2021 has, does diminish the trust in the agency because the question is who is making the decision nationally, internationally, around the world. Uh, most agencies of, of, of the type of ARC uh, are informed by what's known as the Haldane principle, which is that uh, decisions on the best direction of research should be made by those who have the expertise to make those recommendations. So that, that's underpinned part of our review and, 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 and it has been a theme of some of the feedback we've received. The other aspect of the ARC, it was framed in 2001 when the ARC was separated from the Department of Education and Vicky Sara, who became the first CEO, uh, had very big ambitions and so it was framed, I think, in terms of a, an expansionary role for the ARC. So it refers to the National Competitive Grants Program but does not specify who should be funded. Despite the fact that the history of the ARC was that it had been always a, the place where research in Australian universities were funded, um, with the ANU Institute coming in, public universities initially, ANU joining that system in 2001. And that lack of specificity creates unrealistic expectations of the capacity of the ARC to fund outside uh, that uh, envelope of funding organisations. And so myself, Peter would have had this, uh, Aidan Byrne and, and Judy and Sue, that people knock on your door and say, why aren't you funding this? Because it only refers to the National Competitive Grants Program. And then also to then administer a broader program requires a level of resourcing and, and, and um, that uh, the ARC doesn't have in terms of auditing, managing, uh, post-award and so on. So we, we uh, have had a lot of feedback around that and that the need to, um, to clarify exactly what the ARC is there for and who it's for. There's, the board of the ARC was abolished in 2006 uh, following a, a, a whole of government review called the URIG review and Minister Nelson was the minister at the time, um, Peter was there at the time, uh, and uh, was replaced by an advisory council in 2008 when I joined the ARC. But there's a very strong... Um, that's resulted in a lack of continuity in some cases, uh, 
and, and lack of support for the CEO in doing their mission. And so there's fairly strong support in the feedback that we've received uh, that it's timely to re-establish the ARC board to provide the kind of both support and direction to the ARC that, that, that allows more continuity and also uh, still very much as an agency of government, the board would be appointed by the minister within the current guidelines for these kind of boards, but be advisory to, um, um, support the CEO, also the College of Experts, which is um, very critical to their work, and any other advisory committees that people would, um, you know, that, that um, some of our feedback has suggested and that the minister may, may or may not choose to uh, take up in our recommendations. And then uh, that we would still have a very strong agency with academic expertise supplemented by the college and the experience of the board. Uh, defining the purpose within the Act, as I said, the Act actually doesn't specify the, the reality that the ARC funds universities and their partners, and those partners can be very broad, but it's through the vehicle of um, universities managing those uh, grants. Uh, all disciplines except medical and dental research, again, that's not defined in the Act. That was something that was introduced as policy to avoid overlap with the NHMRC doesn't discuss the role, the very important role that the ARC has in shaping the landscape through the way it convenes expertise and the way in which uh, it supports uh, collaborations and merit-based review and, and so on, and uh, a range of other purposes that the ARC has acquired in the interim since it, uh, it was formed in 2001, and so we're considering it and uh, uh, we'll make recommendations around that. When we talk about the ARC and fundamental and basic research, the ARC has, since 2001, had two broad programs. Uh, one is discovery, which is essentially uh, the fundamental or basic or um, investigator, often investigator-driven research, and then the linkage program, which brings together partners in, in collaboration, either between universities, uh, between uh, uh, universities and industry or community organisations and so on. And so that the budget's um, divided uh, between discovery and linkage at various times. Uh, the amount of funding that goes into each of those programs depends on the various initiatives. So the, the peak um, in 2011-2013 in, in was the uh, d introduction of the F Future Fellowship Program as that tailed off and was replaced by other measures. Uh, Discovery's gone down. There's, uh, there are um, investments into the linkage program as the the recent industry program. So there's a bit of um, up and down here, but the, the, the discovery program, which at its peak was 600,000, uh, this year is around um, 500,000, is the main source of fundamental discovery research that feeds the rest of the entire ecosystem. And the importance of that has been stated time and time again during our consultations. Um, and part of the reason for that importance is not that um, applied mission direction and translational research, however you describe it, is not important, but there are many other agencies working in, in that space. Um, and so, and the CRC program, CSIRO, various programs, AIMS, ANSTO, and so on. And so the, the ARC and, and part of the NHMRC is unique in that, in that providing that initial um, discovery-based research, often which leads into things that have been then captured in, in, in these other areas. And I was reflecting to the minister um, uh, yesterday, or yes, yeah, it was only yesterday, that, you know, quantum computing, solar cell technology, our capability in AI and autonomous systems, these were all fed out of discovery programs within the ARC. Uh, everybody's interested and... Um, uh, 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 in the question about research evaluation. And the notion of evaluating research in Australian universities started in early 2003 and 2004 when we were concerned and, and, uh, about the quality of research in Australian universities. We'd had the growth of uh, the unified national system and the government uh, incentives at the time drove quantity over quality. So there was a very strong uh, mood and support to introduce some kind of quality framework. It, Britain had, had done that several years earlier and a lot of work went into thinking about how we could um, develop what started as the research quality framework and ultimately became excellence in research for Australia. And 
it, even from the start of those discussions, we started to see an improvement and a focus on, on quality over quantity. And so um, that then progressed to, after the change of government, to the Excellence in Research for Australia initiative, which um, I variously get described as the chief architect, or someone described me as the mother of ERA. Um, I think Leanne Harvey could also um, make claim uh, to that. But uh, we did a lot of work to make sure that we had a robust system that could have been tied to funding had the government chosen to do that, but that was comprehensive and that also informed not only partners of universities, but universities themselves about what would be international quality benchmarks, what kind of uh, research was uh, being prosecuted on the world stage and so on. And it did, did that for, I think, very successfully for a number of years. And so we had pilot rounds, we had um, uh, full rounds, we added, uh, after my time, the uh, uh, excellence and impact, uh, the evaluation of impact assessment. And that's been incredibly valuable work and um, hugely important to the sector as we've grown and, and emerged. But over time, um, like all good initiatives, sometimes they get to the point where the, the, the amount of effort that goes in uh, uh, is not um, the, the law of diminishing returns, essentially. So there's a huge amount of effort and resources going to ERA and the impact that it's having and uh, the need for ERA is really uh, um, uh, diminished, I think, in terms of uh, there's not much more we could do in that particular framework. There's still a lot of work to do uh, for institutions and for others in, in understanding and the important role of evaluating research. And the ARC has an incredible capacity to do that. It's got um, convening power of experts, it's got huge knowledge about uh, the research sector and, the, and has a great evaluation capability. So the, a lot of the feedback and um, our discussion paper may have led some of that in this direction is that there is still the need uh, to have a robust system that meets the requirements of the TEXA registration and re-registration uh, requirements for institutions in terms of meeting the, um, the research thresholds. There still needs to be the capacity to evaluate specific capability and outcomes. And the one we heard a lot about was the, to the extent that people were disappointed with the pause uh, in ERA was that uh, it would have been the first time with the new field of research code for Indigenous research, and, but that still could happen and, and there are different ways uh, we could work, the ARC could work with the sector to do that. The role that the ARC uh, plays in evaluating uh, both current and future research capability is really important and it will be important as the government reshapes their science and research priorities. So uh, and ex the examples I referred to earlier, some of the work and the prioritisation of, say, quantum technology or the um, complex systems, AI, autonomous systems, that came out of conversations within the ARC and outside about with experts saying this is going to be a big need for Australia. And we saw uh, investments then in centres of excellence in some of those areas that mean that we're now well placed um, to exploit those technologies in a way that we would not have been had we not identified those priorities 15 or 20 years ago. And there's the need for that. And, and the ARC sees that as, you, as you, you get the first of many good ideas or the emerging ideas and you can see trends as different applications come in from different areas and then they can commission and evaluate um, the outcomes of ARC research and see where, the, um, where that's going. So the, that the need to retain a strong a strong evaluation capability within the ARC that supports the sector uh, is um, overwhelming, you know, in the in the responses we've had. But it may take a, a, a different form to the incredibly um, rigorous and well designed but uh, uh, ex era exercise. Uh, then we've got lots of examples of um, processes that over time have become more complex as people have sought to de-risk or had feedback from uh, college members or, 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 or applicants and so on. And uh, we'll pass a lot of those back to the ARC as uh, suggestions that we've received. But I'll just give you an example of how over time uh, something could be introduced and the purpose, the original purpose potentially um, that lost as people sought more detail or more, more clarity around that. And, an example, it's another one that's dear to my heart, um, 
is when we started looking at gender issues uh, within the ARC when I was there, the notion of uh, applicants used to report on track record. And that was the language that was used. And the idea was you got on a track and you never got off. And so that it was really reflecting uh, linear research careers. And as a reviewer and then later working in the ARC, I could see that reviewers would look at the uh, entire track record without taking into account, account um, personal circumstances. So as, as part of a range of reforms, we, we introduced the notion of research opportunity and performance evidence. And in my simple world, that meant, would have meant that when I was applying for an ARC grant, I would have put it, a statement in to say that I had maternity leave in 93 and 94, and, and the years around that, my publication output was a little lower. Later on, I might have been a head of department, um, and, and that impacted on my career. But also, I had a conventional scientific career, so the metrics were pretty OK and, and understood by the committees. But there are other areas, and particularly um, as we were developing indicators for non-traditional research outputs, we knew that computer scientists uh, wanted to publish in conferences, and that was the cutting edge of their field and so on. The opportunity for different fields and those coming from different fields to describe um, their records in different ways. So that became ROPE, and, and it has um, is, is used now, um, that notion of putting research, considering research opportunities uh, is used widely both within the ARC but also within our own universities as we now, in a way that we certainly didn't 20 years ago, take into account those kind of career breaks. But as over time, people wanted to add things into ROPE. And now if you go to the ARC website and look at what you could include in your ROPE, it, it, it's a huge array of uh, activities and, um, and it's one of the things that contributes to the length and the complexity of um, the applications. So this is just one example of where having... The, yep. I'm time. Okay. He's telling me to, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> uh, it's just one example of, of complexity. I'm going to go really quickly. So in summary, um, we have a number of areas with coherent support, strong and uh, desire for strong and transparent governance, the need to renew our approach to research evaluation, com reduce complexity, there's a lot of other work to come, some of which we'll pass back to the ARC, some we'll pass on to the Accord, and we'll deliver our report to the Minister at the end of March, and it'll be released sometime after that, um, not, and it's not imminent. Thank you. And thank you to my panel. Okay. Right. Thank you, Margaret. I understand that there will be questions uh, fed through, and as we wait for those questions, I just want to thank you for also acknowledging the traditional owners, something I failed to do and should have done, so thank you for doing that. Uh, there, there's a question here which is said, what can be done to make the application process smoother and less time consuming for researchers and research officers? Um, so that's, we've had a lot of feedback on that. I, I know the ARC is doing this process review and um, there are different um, different ways that that can be done. There's been uh, uh, obviously uh, a, a lot of feedback about the length of applications, again, as requirements have been added, some of which come from, you know, changes in government grant guidelines, some of which came from requests from uh, applicants themselves. And so I think the work that's going on, on it within the ARC at the moment and also the the input and feedback we've had as part of our review, which we'll pass on to the ARC, there's a very strong desire to uh, simplify application processes. There's a lot of conversations about whether different stages and, uh, of applications it would make it easier, you know, mm. and a, a strong desire to have shorter turnaround times, mm. but, um, uh, and also, um, uh, you know, um, more feedback. And so all of those come with a cost in time and, uh, and complexity and, and, you know, we've been given good examples from around the world that we uh, will share with the ARC and I know there's a strong desire to, um, to reduce that mm. but while still providing enough information to have a very good and robust selection process. Yeah, uh, so I think a cost-benefit analysis of, of, of the requirements of researchers is important. Yeah. Uh, there was a psychologist uh, who was quite upset with me once when I introduced a new policy at a university I ran, and uh, this uh, psychologist said, 
in a certain European country. They put so many signs up in the road. There was a crest, there was a ditch, there was a pothole that people looked at all the signs and ran off the road because of all those signs. <laughs> and it, it just occurs to me that uh, the, the proportional space allocated to describing why the research is great and would benefit society is disproportionately small to all the other requirements. So I, I think we have to take a bit of risk, calculate a risk. Yeah, and I mean, I use the rope example because I um, could also be described as the mother of rope. And uh, it, it, it just it started with one purpose and became very, very big. And it's all valuable information, but it's not as um, useful in trying to decide between applications once you get the basic information there as the quality and the innovation around the project, which is where we should be focusing the reviewers' efforts um, and, and, and also the applicant's time. You know, yeah. so. I encourage you to put questions up. Uh, I don't know whether they are particularly challenging questions and have, and have been moderated out, but uh, we don't have any other questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Margaret, um, in, in terms of ERA, which I agree with you, was incredibly important at the time it was recommended in, in a review in 2003, uh, there was a fundamental change in ERA and that was that the era results went from being monetized to not monetized. Uh, could you reflect on, 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 on the value uh, of, of monetizing and not monetizing, and also about how the country, in the absence of era, gets a good feel for how we're traveling as a country in, in our research capability? Yes, yeah, so, so part of the burden of era, if I can describe it about that, and the rigor around ensuring that outputs are allocated to the right institution and so on, was we did design it in a way that it could have been tied to funding. In order to tie it to funding, it needed to add a volume measure, which we didn't explicitly include in the first uh, round, but it could have been done. Um, and it, uh, I, the thing that I wanted to tie it to was PhD places, uh, because at the, time, at the same time as we were developing ERA, we doubled the number of PhD students. But through various, um, you know, changes uh, in uh, people, personnel and, and policy, the original um, uh, first few rounds that were tied to the Sustainable Research Excellence Funding, as that funding pot, the dual funding, was... Um, uh, uh, that, that, that was reviewed. The link to error was taken away and then it became just much more about reputation and also informing institutions um, about their own capability. We now have so many other measures of, um, of quality and uh, ways of benchmarking both our individuals and our uh, different areas within universities that, um, uh, which we didn't have in 2003. I couldn't go on to... Uh, uh, you know, the equivalent of, I'm going to show my age here, the web of science and work out whether someone, ha you know, what their field-weighted citation index was and so on. We just didn't have that information. And so the, the and we still, for many areas, need the, the benefit of peer review. And so metrics is not the solution across all disciplines. But we have a vast amount of array of more information. The government has more information. And I think we have to start moving to evaluate the effectiveness of different programs so that we know um, uh, we have a, a better evidence base about what works. Uh, and so I think that that's where that incredible mm. capability within mm. the ARC mm. could go to. Um, you know, it, it, I, I think the moment passed. We had a period where the, the era had been um, widely accepted. The, the formulas were there to tie it to funding, but the politics and the various other things didn't mm. Um, mm. allow that to happen. And again, it might be that the app is not working because I cannot believe that there wouldn't be lots of questions and views here, but uh, unless I'm doing something wrong, uh, I'll, I'll continue to <laughs> ask you questions. Uh, I remember in 2005, we benchmarked uh, the ARC and the ratio between what it cost to run the agency and the funding it was responsible for allocating to Australian researchers. And it was incredibly low. In a world, uh, it could be utopia I'm talking about now, where there were an uplift to the ARC, uh, for the ARC to perhaps have more time to strategically engage with our research calibre, which is really high, 
what, what, what ideally would, do you think the ARC could do with additional resource and, and, and expertise allocated to it that would benefit uh, all our uh, university researchers? So, um, yeah, I mean, it was low and it became... Uh, Katrina's just handing you a phone with questions, which we don't have. <laughs> um, oh. oh, no, we do have questions, but I'll, I'll answer this one. Um, so, when, I, when you finished, the ARC was operating on about 2.2 or 3% of the funding that it was administering. When I left, it was 1.7. I have no idea what, how low it is now. Um, but when I spoke to the NSF colleagues yesterday and I asked them a question about how, much, how many program directors they had within the, in the agency, and she said, oh, I don't know, two, three hundred? And I said, well, I had five when I left. Five academics. I was the chemistry person, you know. And so having more capacity to have convene and have in place that, that expertise that could then do more work on, I think, the forecasting, the future um, uh, planning of, of, of where the research investment could go, uh, we just... We, you know, that we, we lost that capacity yeah. with the diminishing um, expertise. And as and, an outsider, it looks as if uh, it would be good to be able to, to enhance that capability. Yeah, I well, you know, yeah. all these program and, and things that I talked about, it was all work done by the executive directors yeah. that I, yeah. uh, who we had at the time. Okay, so, uh, oh, it's up there now too, and it's on the phone. Does the ARC have a role in improving the handling, retention, availability of and availability of researcher and in helping to remove issues around data as a barrier for researchers. This is from Angus Griffin. So um, obviously the ARC can set requirements for um, you know, ARC, those that they fund. Uh, because of the way, uh, again, the way things have, have, have evolved and been funded within Australia, a lot of that came through different um, bodies where we were, you know, the capacity to support data with ANS and, and its predecessors and so on. Um, and uh, it's also tied up with the question of infrastructure. But the, where the ARC has a role, I think, is in setting a standard uh, or an expectation about research that the ARC funds. Rather, it just does not have the capacity to cu curate that data mm. in any way, mm. other than on the grants or the outcomes of grants themselves. Yeah. And maybe... Uh, one of the biggest natural experiments that has been run over the last three years, uh, and we didn't want it to happen, but it happened, was, was the global COVID pandemic. And going to data, uh, it inspired an incredible amount of energy amongst researchers. Uh, how do we capture all the learnings from this going forward? Well, it's interesting. I think one of the things that... Um, uh, we, we had a lot of, we did um, uh, feedback from the College of Experts and the question, the benefits of actually uh, being able to do assessments online and then potentially access um, uh, reviewers from around the world and then, um, but also uh, the speed to, to implementation and the idea of, you know, uh, faster turnaround for really, really hot areas of research in terms of funding and so on. I think um, there, there are many things that collectively we could um, uh, pull together out of the pandemic, as well as the challenges of trying to do all that stuff <laughs> uh, mm. um, uh, while managing uh, home lives and other things. But I think for me, the, and you would have found this too, it was hard to get international reviewers to respond to the yeah. ARC, particularly after periods of political interference, uh, because they felt that their work wasn't being valued. Mm -hmm. And I think the capacity to bring more international reviewers into the system, uh, and into the panels and into the assessment is yeah. going to be important. No. And it's also important engagement. And Margaret, uh, a very popular question is, what can we learn from overseas about how to fund research in Australia? Uh, well, Value experts, faster turnarounds, um, and uh, one, of, one of the things that you look at, if you look at, at any system around the world, the government actually stays in fundamental research longer uh, down that pipeline than they do in Australia. So it's counterintuitive. You get more innovation the longer the government funds fundamental and basic research, uh, and 
so, so I guess, it, I remember David Willett said this, a former UK minister many years ago, the government has to hang in there through the risky period and then you'll get the true innovation and commercial outcomes. And I think that would be a really, really laudable outcome flowing from your strong insights. Thank you, everyone, and thanks, Margaret. Thank the internationalization of higher education through mobility of students has grown considerably over the past few years. They add to the skilled workforce and create meaningful connections. But also, there have been instances of documentary frauds at the time of admission. To eliminate that, a thorough background check is required by the institutions. This is where the need of a trusted credential evaluation partner, CredEvaluate Global, arises, who follows due diligence, ensuring the onboarding of only genuine candidates to top institutions. Specializing in assessing frauds, Cred Evaluate Global conducts due diligence using AI-powered software platform Cred Evaluate Assessment Central to assess the credentials of the applicants. We consistently achieve operational excellence in faster turnaround time with high quality, integrity, ethics and transparency. We endeavor to become the trusted and preferred compliance partner to the global institutions.